Welcome to another episode of the Zealous Podcast. I'm Rocky Snyder. This week, my guest is Rick Smith Jr. Now, Rick and his family are, probably have the greatest family tree of professional hockey players you could ever imagine. Grandparents, father, uncles, cousins. I mean, it's an entire web, actually, of professional hockey players. And we're going to talk about Rick's experience in professional hockey off the ice and on the ice and the things that he had to struggle with and get over, and now what he's doing to help people with behavior change. So I really hope you enjoy this. This one kind of hits home for me, and it's a little bit off the beaten path than what we normally talk about. So hopefully you'll find it just as refreshing as I did. Remember, follow us on Instagram, at Rocky underscore Schneider. Click that subscribe button, and away we go. You know, talk sure. about a little bit of your journey that you've had, and how far you got with professional sports, Maybe, you know, your, share your experience, strength, and hope, basically, is what we're going for, right? Yeah, yeah, I love that. Um, yeah, so again, you know, I'm Rick Smith, Jr. Uh, I, I come from a, a really big hockey background as far as the family tree there with, with relatives. And my dad, who played for the Cincinnati Bearcats back in the day and then was in the minors, um, my grandfather, who he played for the St. Louis Blues, Bill McCreary, uh, was actually made it to the Stanley Cup Finals and um, that uh, glorious picture of Bobby Orr going across the crease flying through the air. Um, he was on that team. Uh, unfortunately, they lost against the Bruins that year. So, you know, my grandfather to my uncle, the other Bill McCreary, he was infamous for the big head on hit on Wayne Gretzky back in the day on the blue line. Um, and then the family tree just keeps expanding. My, my great uncle, my grandfather's brother, Keith McCreary, uh, he was the captain for the Atlanta Flames before they went to Calgary. He was the assistant captain for the Pittsburgh Penguins at one point. My cousin Bob Atwell played for the Colorado Rockies back in the day. My other cousin Greg Taberge played for the Washington Capitals. Uh, my other great uncle um, Ron Atwell played for St. Louis as well, the New York Rangers. Uh, we had a cousin, Bill McCreary, who was the referee that uh, was inducted into the Hall of Fame a number of years back. And then we've got a bunch of us, too, um, who, you know, went on and, and played professionally or played in juniors or played at college. So uh, <laughs> so there was a hockey stick in every cradle is what you're Good saying. Lord. I mean, yeah, pretty much. We were coming out with skates and sticks and we were ready to go. You weren't sucking on pacifiers. You had a puck in your mouth. That's it. <laughs> That's crazy. I, know, I don't right? think I've heard of such a broad family tree. I mean, there's the Mannings in the NFL, right? And there's a whole bunch of other families, but I don't think anything as extensive as what you just laid out. That's phenomenal. So uh, obviously it, you, you came from a long, proud line of hockey tradition. Yeah, yeah. Wow. it was. I, and, you know, growing up in that, you know, uh, of course, when you're a kid and back in the day, I was watching CBC, you know, Hockey Night in Canada on Saturday nights. And, you know, uh, it was just in your mind, all the heroes that you would see or, uh, you know, your idols on TV. And then you've got your family tree. And it was just, uh, you know, I was like a deer in the headlights, you know, even as a kid with my own family members and hearing the stories, you know, it was uh, it was pretty special growing up. I bet. So obviously you grew up with hockey through high school into college and you yourself make it into the professional ranks. What was that like? Yeah. So I actually, I left home when I was 15 years old. So I come from a small rural town, Brighton, Michigan, uh, went to high school there. And then I left to Toronto. So a big metropolis of course, two different ends of the spectrum from cow tipping to now figuring out transits and subways and trolleys and all that fun stuff. So yeah, I moved away from home and uh, was chasing the NHL dream at 15, um, was drafted into the OHL. Uh, I did have aspirations. I was kind of at that cusp of choosing that wine, the road of going to college, had conversations with Red Berenson back in the day for University of Michigan, Ron Mason at Michigan State, the list goes on, but I chose to go the OHL route. So um from there, uh, after my last season in the Ontario Hockey League, uh, I played in the minors. Uh, my first year was in Birmingham, Alabama for the Birmingham Bulls. And then the following season was uh, with the uh, New Orleans Brass, which was an affiliate of uh, the San Jose Sharks and the Nashville Predators. Wow. 
And of course, at, at that level of professional hockey, it, it's just bare. You could just barely say you're a professional. I mean, you just had enough to. Uh, they they may have taken care of some of your meals and of course your travel expense, but there you didn't have a lot in your pocket, right? Yeah, I mean, at that time, it wasn't until uh, I played in the IHL too, where you know they're picking up your mortgage. Um, obviously, you know you're getting a weekly salary and things like that. So it was a lifestyle where you know everything was basically paid for uh, per diem, all that good stuff. But yeah, to your point, it's like I've always said to people. It wasn't, uh, you know, my, my pockets weren't lined with, uh, you know, a lot of money. So, uh, you know, when you're playing in the minors, guys are, they're looking to get to that next level and uh, they're looking to do it quickly. Yeah, this is the story that we don't often hear. You know, most of the attention is, is garnished toward the elite level athletes that have found a way to make it to the NHL or to other top level uh, of the sport of their choosing, uh, but you don't hear about the the climbing, the scratching and clawing to try and get up there. What what was that like? I mean, from a mental standpoint, from a physical standpoint, you have dreams and aspirations to be like your great uncles and your grandfathers and all these others that you just mentioned. But it it's a lot of work. It is. Um... You know, for me, at one point in my career, there was a couple, uh, this is going to be in the autobiography that's coming out next year, but I had some major stumbling blocks. I I, um, I made the U.S. World Junior Team at one point, and then I blew out. I got that news. The coach calls me into the office two weeks later. I blew out my ACL, and there, go, there goes my season. I was having a breakout season. Things were going great, and uh, I started to, um, to basically uh, – deal with those situations not in a productive way which we can get into in a little bit here uh, but then I also had another opportunity um, you know where I did put on that USA jersey at the international level and so there was these little like moments where all right you know we're in this light and this is the opportunity where you need to shine um, unfortunately through injuries uh, some off-ice uh, habits that I had you know, I literally had a guy by the name of Pete DeBoer, who's actually a coach in NHL now still today. But, you know, he basically said to me uh, and I was playing in the OHL and he said, look, you know, last name, of course, Smith and Smitty was my nickname. He said, Smitty, you know, you're going to be a professional next year and you need to start acting like one. This is this is a career. You can make this a career. Um, and really what he was telling me in that moment was, you know, I needed to apply myself and let go of the off ice stuff that was going on and really concentrate uh, on hockey. And, um, you know, some other things started to slide into my life at that time. And so, you know, unfortunately, when you have curfew violations that happened at one year, you know, one year and you're on the front page of the newspaper, that's not too good. Uh, you're right beside the Red Wings and, you know, their nightcap from the night before of, you know, scouts and everybody else reading that newspaper and, and then you get traded away um, another season, you know, at the end of my OHL career. And then it happened again when I was in the minors. And so, you know, when you're kicking, scratching, you know, fighting, trying to get to the next level and you don't have the focus, the laser focus that you need to get to the next level. And you are, uh, you know, taking part in the extracurricular activities, so to speak, um, you know, bad things happen. And so that's that's part of my story. Uh you know, and not making it to the next level is the things that I was doing off ice. Well, let's let's dive into that because you and I have that in common. I mean, it's not something that I really bring up in a lot of podcasts, but this is one that I think would really give us both permission to it, it share our experiences. You know, you and I have both been without alcohol or chemicals, shall we say, for many years now. And, and that's the off-ice behavior that we're talking about, the self-sabotage, the self-medication, the things that try to fill a hole that's in our spirit, and it just makes the hole bigger, and we just try and fill it with more, and it just never, never gets to the surface, and so we just keep stuffing it. I mean, that's what we're talking about, right? Absolutely. Yeah, it's, uh, it's progressive. Um... You know, and what I mean by that is uh, for, for every happening, it just progressively got worse. You know, I um, after that conversation with Pete uh, DeBoer, um, 
you know, I had my 21st birthday and it, it was a gong show. Uh, my parents were gone and don't need to really get into the specifics on that, but um, there's not enough time. Uh, I, I evaluated myself and I, I, you know, my dad got sober. And so I saw a role model from him and the changes that were happening inside the household of growing up as being a child of an alcoholic, living in that dysfunction and then seeing my parents get healthy. And then, so I saw this changes in my dad and I saw that, okay, well, you know what? He's made some changes here and maybe I need to take a look at myself and do the same thing. So uh, that would have been um, July, July at the, so that, no, it would have been August 1st or 2nd. I'd have to go back and look at my discharge papers from rehab, but it was 1999. Went into rehab for 30 days was, uh, in Hazelden in Minnesota, Minneapolis, went there. Um, and it really did give me a perspective and an eye opener to myself and, and really, you know, where I was through that progress, a progression of, of things getting worse. And so I said, look, you know, if I want to give this hockey thing a shot, like I got to get sober. And, you know, furthermore, uh, I was going to play my first year pro I had signed my contract in the minors and I wanted to give this the best effort that I could to try and get to the next level. So I went into camp, had a great camp. Um, I centered, was on the third line for the all rookie line essentially, but was having a great season. I mean, phenomenal. Scored my first professional hat trick, like things were going really well. Wow. And then at the end of that season, you know, uh, I fell off and I was sober for about six months, but I was just like, oh, hanging on. I was white knuckling it, you know? wasn't staying in contact with people who were sober, uh, wasn't going into any support group meetings, was hanging around in places that I shouldn't have been in. And, you know, you stick around that fire long enough, you're going to find yourself picking up again. So I went into rehab essentially just on drinking alone, had, you know, smoked some things here and there. But um, when I relapsed and they talk about, you know, uh, our addiction, just waiting there doing push-ups for us. I mean, I, I, I experienced that firsthand because I got into drugs, you know, I, I got into the cocaine and the ecstasy and other various uh, drugs and it was just a slippery slope. And um, I found myself at the end of that season going home, like, all right, like, how am I going to hide this? First of all, from my parents. Uh, second of all, you know, I had all the feelings come along with that shame, guilt, remorse, you know, I got sober and now like I'm going back and I've reverted to old behaviors. So uh, that next season, I asked to be traded as far away as I could be. I was going to make a geographical change and go across country. That'll do it. Oh, yeah. That's going to fix yeah. everything. Yeah. The problem is you take yourself with you. So, sure. OK, so where did you go? I was in Tucson, Arizona. And um, here I am, you know, and it just got worse. I uh, had friends out there in Phoenix and, you know, uh, the drug scene just continued to escalate for me. Uh, I always so, thought to myself, you know, these people that did cocaine and other various drugs, like these people are absolute losers, you know, and I turned into that loser, essentially. Um, the team, unfortunately, we had a really good assembly of uh athletes that were out there that had signed that year to that team were looking to do some big things ownership uh they basically pulled the plug and so uh you had 25 plus guys that were sitting there without a job at that point saying where are we going to go so they pulled the plug on starting that season and they basically um folded and so um i said well you know what I played in Birmingham the previous season and I remember going to New Orleans, uh, but I did that sober. So let's see what this is like going to New Orleans um, and I can have some fun there. Fun, right? And um, I drove from Tucson, Arizona, <clears throat> got to New Orleans. And that was just the pinnacle for me of uh, the climax of my addiction. Um, I was having a great start to my season again. You'd think, you know, being affiliated with San Jose and, and, uh, uh, the predators that, uh, you know, you'd shape up and be there with guys that were under contract and whatnot. And, um, you know, I was holding steady for a while and then halfway through the season, just my body couldn't keep up with what I was doing to it. By the end of the season, um, that coach, another NHL coach, Ted Sater, he, uh, he just 
they took me into the office with the GM and he said, look, Smitty, you know, uh, some guys can do this off the ice and some guys can't, and you're not one of them. And uh, we're releasing you. And so uh, we can't, we can't deal with what you're doing anymore because you're not producing and playing the way that uh, when you first came in here and what we thought you were going to be, and, whew, you know, uh, a punch to the gut. Um, yeah. It was, um, at that time I was, uh, what, 22, you know, I'm thinking to myself, all right, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm angry. It's all about him. It's got nothing to do with me, you know? And, uh, I took off, uh, I went to Pensacola, Florida after that. I got even further away from home. Um, didn't let my family know where I was. Uh, it still, it still hurts me to this day of what my family went through because as an addict, you know, as you know, you're not only impacting yourself, but you're impacting all the people around you. My dad was calling the morgues, was calling the police stations. My brother was having nightmares about, uh, you know, me being in an accident or somebody killing me. And I basically went missing for almost three months down in Pensacola, Florida. And it just, uh, again, the, the addiction was running rampant at that point. And, um, you know, uh, one day I found myself just, uh, still high and drunk from the night before I was sitting on the beach, Pensacola beach. And I still remember it to this day. And the sun was coming up and it was, you know, 75 degrees. I'm sitting in the sand with my other two buddies and, um, I'm watching the waves roll in and, you know, hearing the sound from the waves and just feeling the sun on my face. And I looked out in the ocean, out into the horizon. And I was just like, is this what, is this what my life's all about? Like, have I not had enough pain? And it was that little spark. I still didn't get sober after that moment, but it was that moment that I still remember to this day. Like, am I getting closer to being at bottom? Yeah. How about that? Bottom. The definition I hear is uh, bottom occurs when you, uh, when the consequences build up faster than you can lower your standards. Mm. Right. Mm. I'm curious. This is, a, I love your, your candor, your honesty, your, your, um, your willingness to expose all this and, and be vulnerable. That's really uh, admirable. Thank is, you. Is, yeah, is, you know, I'm just thinking like through my high school and college years, uh, the way that I got myself through school primarily, because I came from a really a blue collar community outside Boston and uh, not many of us uh, in the family went on to college or anything, but we're, my folks were uh, vehemently into me going and so on. Uh, so I got myself through, co through college by working in restaurants and like Anthony Bourdain's Kitchen Confidential. Yeah. It's pretty true. Like that environment in the kitchen and in wait staff, you can get anything you want there in terms mm -hmm. of drugs and alcohol. The bar was always open. And if you're yeah. closing up for the night, you know, there's always a beer available from the tap. It, is that like that in the OHL, AHL, all the like in in professional sports? Is it just something that we're not really talking about? I think it's become I think it's become better through the years. I have a cousin who actually works with the NHL alumni, uh, Wendy McCreary. Um, and and they do have a program to help uh athletes you know hockey players through a certain program there with the alumni um and and i you know i i believe that people are being more open and honest about what's going on in their lives which I, look you know that's you talked about being transparent um like if we're going to get anywhere as in humanity the only way we can do that is to be transparent with each other that's my belief um I think things have started to shift and change. It's still prevalent, but it was definitely a lot different from when I was coming up through the ranks to where it is today. Um, I think that uh, it's not so much frowned upon or you know, we're gonna sweep this under the rug uh, or what's the matter with you, you don't drink. Um, because I, there was a point in my career where I did come out of retirement and I did play in the minors again. Uh, you know, coincidentally enough, it was a, an odd season, but it was 0405, I believe was the season when the NHL lockout had happened. So I actually played here in Detroit with Chris Chelios and Darian Hatcher and Brian Smolinski and Sean Avery. So it was, uh, it was a great memory that season, but what I really admired about the respect factor towards me when we did go out to dinner 
or after a game, um, you know, I, I let everybody know like up front, like I don't, I don't drink and please don't pressure me. You know, I was just really firm in my program at that time. Uh, everybody. And I mean, everybody was super respectful um, of, of where I was, you know, with my recovery. And so I found it just to be a big shift. Maybe it was being, you know, around more mature guys at that point in my career, obviously when you're a little bit younger, you know, different things that are going on in your mind, as far as, you know, like trying to be the cool kids and, you know, be it with the, with the bunch that are popular and things like that. So, you know, once I got past that, I really just wanted to live with, within my recovery. Um, you know, I just found like, I'm not, I'm not afraid to share what's going on with me. And that was kind of a turning point for me. Um, but you know, it does, it's still out there. It's still deep. I, I only came across one guy ever that I played with who, never drank or did any sort of drugs. And that, that was one guy, you know, out of so many other players that I played with. So it's still out there. Um, but I think it's talked about a lot more today. Yeah. And well, hockey still, it has the roots of being a good old boy sport, right. You know, sure. and, and hockey town and blue collar communities. And that's a big part of the culture is drinking. And, yep. uh, and it's equated with celebrating and, and it's really hard to go to any event, even, even in today's world of like health and fitness conferences, there's almost always some type of social, a social night or social gathering, which is fine. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting that how we are trying to get to the zenith of performance and, and efficiency and, and creating whether you have clients that are athletes or you are an athlete yourself and you're trying to get that pinnacle performance. And yet we are infusing this type of behavior or elements into it in a socially acceptable way that is pulling us away from our desires, dreams, and goals. Isn't that just like, you know, now that we have a little bit more clarity, we, we see the irony and, and the absurdity within. Well, we're going to take a little break in the action right now to tell you about a course that I'll be teaching at the Perform Better Functional Training Institute this January 21st, 2023. It's all about anatomy and motion, understanding what happens when the foot strikes the ground all the way through the chain, at least for the lower body, lower body, closed chain biomechanics. And this is a game changer. Once you understand how joints move, then you can get a better understanding of how muscles react to those joint motions. And when it comes to program design for athletic trainers, physical therapists, strength coaches and the like, even manual therapists, this is information you want to know. So you can go to RockySnyder.com and check in with courses and workshops. Click there and it'll lead you where you can register for this one day event. Again, perform better in West Warwick, Rhode Island. Hope to see you there. I mean, I do. Do you? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I always say if I could go back and talk to my younger self, right? But I mean, I had my dad sitting there telling me, I had other friends telling me, um, I just wasn't ready. But yeah, I look at what I do today for myself, you know, because once I, I, I pushed Rick away, I literally said, I'm done with this guy and went, I'm making a complete change to move in the other direction. Um, I just immersed myself uh, just in all different types of healthy behaviors uh, from the foods that I eat to the nutrition. Like, I'll just give you an example. Um, you know, my son is three years old and, you know, I'm a call it 80, 20, even some weeks, you know, I'm 90, 10, as far as, you know, how I eat and take care of myself. Of course, I like to indulge in things who doesn't, but uh, I like my baked goods. Um, so all that to be said, you know, I'm eating breakfast and then I take my vitamins. And so my son wants to take vitamins with me and my garage, we don't park our cars in our garage. I have a full on gym out there with basically everything that you'd want in a gym. And, uh, you know, he sees dad working out. Um, and so all of these things that I've done now, I'm at 44, you know, if you were to go back uh, and implement the things that I've done, you can always say that coulda, woulda, shoulda, but, um, you know, these are the things that built in, focusing around your sleep, focusing on that nutrition, you know, what are you doing in your workouts? What are you doing every day to build into yourself and separate yourself from the competition, so to speak, if you are talking about an athlete or really just anybody in general, you know, if we're talking about longevity in life, because uh, all the other things I was doing on this other side, I mean, my crash course, it was, um, 
I was looking at 30. That was my target. Uh, I was going to kill myself. I had suicidal thoughts and those behaviors were taking me there. Well, we were killing ourselves. Honestly. Sure. I mean, it was just a slow process. It wasn't like jumping off a bridge or putting a gun to your head, but every time you brought the bottle up or, or took a snort of this or took a puff of that, I'm, it wasn't going toward longevity. Let's just put that there. And, yeah. you know, I, we can apply the labels of good, bad to all the elements of our life and our past, but it brought us together here at this moment in time. Absolutely. Right? Everything, the, the, the things that I might cringe about and my behavior and decision making still was elements that gave me experience. And we're not going to gain a lot of learning and, and education from the things we do well and the things we do right. Normally, we gain experience from our own mistakes. And I think both of us have a tremendous amount of experience based on our stories here. So, so I'm interested in this, Rick, is that you've accumulated so much of this experience that you're willing to share it with others. Uh, and, and, and that's a big part of what you do these days. And, and tell me a little bit more about that. You're the coaching, the, the speaking, like who do, you, who do you go after with this? Are you, are you talking to the up and coming hockey players or is it a broader base? Where, where, are, you, where are you kind of focused on now? Yeah, uh, great question. And I think to, to your point too, um, I'll segue into it is, I mean, like, act, you know, my shirt's got it on there, right? Grateful. Uh, there we go. Nice, <laughs> nice. Uh, I am grateful for the struggles that I've gone through. And people look at me like, why, are you, how can you be grateful for what, all those bad moments, right? Bad, good. Eh, maybe it's more like uh, learning experiences. And so for me, when I do look at my past, I'm grateful because it has molded me into the person I am today because I have made the necessary changes. So um, I do, I find, I find immense gratitude in that. Um, so for me, the, it's, it's many different avenues, many different people that I come in contact with uh, from, you know, people that are trying, you know, I just had an old teammate um, from 20 year, 20 plus years ago. He reached out to me yesterday to say, hey man, life's not going so well, you know, can you point me in the right direction? I know you're sober and you've got a long time and, you know, obviously it looks like things are going really well for you. And so we had a good, we had a very direct conversation. Nice. <laughs> um, and those are the type of the conversations I like to have. Cause as I like to say, like, I don't like to go snorkeling and have surf surface level conversation. I like to go scuba diving. Let's go deep, you know, cause that's where we get ahead in life is having these deep uh, conversations. So um, people will reach out from, from that standpoint. I've, I, uh, you know, I know we've talked before, but I kind of let that myself too let that anonymity go out the window because I thought to myself, listen, I've been given this story and it's not to keep for myself and it's not to be behind closed doors. Like if I put myself out there, I know it's going to help and impact other people. Um, so well, people we've, we've felt what it was like to keep secrets to ourselves, And, and there yeah. is a saying that we're only as sick as our secrets. So getting down deep and exposing those and being willing to kind of share with others is is a huge part of um, self-improvement, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and for me, even talking about it today, as I continue to even dive into it more when I talk to others, it's still healing for me to talk about it. You know, even after all these years, it's healing. Uh, but just like when I when I first came back, you know, I relapsed and I reached out to a friend that last time when I did want to live, you know, I wanted to live. And, and he basically just said, dust yourself off, grab a shower. You and I are going to go grab dinner and then we're going to go to a support group meeting without, you know, um, looking at me or judging me from a different light. He just put me under his arm and said, let's go, brother. I got gotcha. you. And so that's where, like, I think about all these people from when I first got sober and all the time that they just gave me, like the most precious thing is time. And these people did nothing but give that to me, you know, and so it's only appropriate that uh, anytime somebody reaches out me, especially in the addiction corner, look, I'll, I'll help anybody, but I'll literally take my shirt off my own back to go help out somebody today that's really struggling, still sick and suffering out there. But, you know, um, coming back to what you were asking, yes, um, I do uh, human performance when we talk about working on mindset with uh, teams, doing a, a speaking engagement next week on that, you know, working with teams, um, different environments with different organizations as far as helping with uh, uh, leadership, 
getting past the fear of failures, fears in general, um, belief, uh, just really helping people out with performance, whether it be in sales to um, believing in themselves. So many different environments to where uh, I speak and, and uh, uh, offer help too. So that's, that's really cool. And I would love to dive deeper into that. Like, well, fear is the mind killer. I'd take that phrase from Frank Herbert and uh, author of the Dune Chronicles, right? That uh, fear is the acronym that just says F everything and run away or yeah. face everything and recover, right? We could turn yeah. that on its head. So, so what is, what's your approach with these, these teams when you're talking about um, fear or self-sabotage or what are the blocks that are getting in your way, the detours or whatever. How do, how do you take that approach? I face them head on. So the one thing in that, uh, you know, I always start with is just basically a question of, um, you know, the, the number one uh, human negative thought, the number one is fear. And, and so it doesn't matter if it's uh, a male that has fear of going to talking to a female, if it's the fear of, uh, you know, what my coach is going to think or the fear of what this person's going to think if I do this over here. There's just so many environments of where fear can, it's like a thorn and it just stabs itself right in the middle. And so we have to get to the corner of that and pull that bad boy out. And, and what I do is I like to hit that first, like dead on. And so we talk about the fear of failures. We get past that because we share, you know, stories that you, you've probably heard in the past of, how many times Babe Ruth struck out, you know, how many times um, Macy got turned down before, you know, his store went into New York and uh, um, uh, uh, I forget the, the notable writer, uh, his name, but, you know, he got turned down by over 500 plus publishing companies. And then he went on to author over 600 books, you know, so there's all these fears of failure, right. That kind of get associated with sports in general, but, uh, what I like to do is, is I like to sit there and it's a tough moment because normally you're not going to, in a setting of other teammates, expose what you're afraid of. And so if I can get you past that and take 10 minutes, talk about fear, what it really is, and the fear of failure, you know, when people talk about failure, if we're looking at it in that context, the fear of failure, you're looking at really analytics, like anything in life is analytics. So really all failure is, it's an analytic to say, did this work or didn't it? That's all it is. It's not that, okay, this is a final absolute. I can't do this ever again. It's just saying, hey, maybe we didn't have the right play here that happened going down the ice and we need to do something different. So, you know, when we're talking about the fear of failure specifically, I like to look at it as a form of uh, analytics. All it is, is giving feedback. And so when we're talking about the athletes, uh, cause I still want them to be creative. I still want them to go and try and move and not, you know, if it didn't work out one time, it doesn't mean that you can't try it again. And we try to get to the root of what is it that they're fearing? Yeah. And flip that on its head too. There's often the fear of success. It's like, Oh man, mm -hmm. if I succeed at this and there's going to be a certain expectation, which is oh, obviously man you know, self-created expectation. No one's actually saying we're going to expect this from you, but it's something that's built in. It's these little gerbils inside of our head on the wheel yeah. just keep on running. Sometimes we're able to shut off the noise and other times it just, it just takes over. I mean, I just, I recall those, those voices, they weren't a gerbil. They were like a 400 pound vulture that's, that just sat on the footboard of my bed when I woke up in the morning, it would just be, Hey, good morning. Let's do some talking <laughs> about how yeah. you're not going to succeed. And right. then, you know, over time of, of talking this out with guys like yourself and others that are going through it, you know, we really get to realize, Oh, that vulture is actually just this little hummingbird that flits in every now and then. And uh, I can pay attention to it and, and recognize that, okay, this is still happening. But uh, other times I'm like, yeah, thanks for sharing, but I'm, I'm going to kind of, pay attention to this other direction and, and go where I know I need to go. I don't need any more self-criticism. So what do you do? Uh, do you do certain kind of activities, breakouts? How mm -hmm. is it you facilitate this? I'm kind of curious, especially with like the athletes that you're working with. How do you, how do you get them to get over the mental blocks and the self-sabotage? 
So, yeah, I think it's, uh, I, uh, it's all different based on the age too. Cause like, you know, I'm working with, um, you know, kids all the way down to 14 years old, uh, triple a players that are starting to work their way up through the ranks. Uh, it's going to be different for a professional athlete, but let's just use these 14 years old, 14 year olds as an example everything that we're doing as parents. And that's something that I, I take ownership and responsibility over myself. Now having a three-year-old, they're watching everything that we're doing. So if, if, if I'm telling my son that he needs to eat well and take his vitamins and work out, well, guess what? I better be, I better be doing the exact same thing and have take the ownership on myself. So when we're talking about the younger kids, what I like to do, and I know coaches kind of look at me like, wait a minute, you want all the parents to be here? Yeah, I do. And so there's a reason for that. And it's because I want them to hear the message. I'm not saying, pointing fingers, saying, hey, you need to do this. I am, of course, sharing the information so that they're like, oh, wait a minute. Maybe I need to take a look at myself on some things I need to change at home so that I can help my son or daughter out. Brilliant. So it's, it's a big moment, not just for the players, especially in that age group. But it's also an opportunity for these parents to step up too to say, hey, you know what, there's some behavior changes here that I can help not only my son, but the team. And when we start wrapping our head around, how can we make this a better team? Now take that home. How can we make this better in the four walls at home? Uh, we're really breeding into uh, what's going to develop that athlete as they get older. That's really cool. I'm thinking about the, the built-in hypocrisy within the family structure. And, 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 you know, it, it happens in, in minor levels and then in, in, in more major elements. But a simple example would be seeing along the beach here, beach cruisers and families on their bicycles and the kids have helmets, but the, the parents don't. And we're like, OK, so the message that you're sending is that you need to do what I'm saying, but not what I'm doing. And when you get old enough to make a decision, then you can do away with your safety. Uh, you know, it's my head is maybe the parents' skulls are thicker. That's what I'm thinking. And so if they fall, they won't be injured and therefore, you know, have a, an impact on their family. But we know that's not true. It's right. the same thing with, you know, we could talk about drugs and alcohol, you know, especially alcohol. It's just socially acceptable, but the kids can't do it. You got to wait till you're this age. So a lot of mixed messages. How do you deal with the mixed messages? So that gets into, you know, uh, when, when I'm working with the kids, what I try and get them to do is to um, understand how impactful belief is. Uh, because the, the mixed messages that can happen, I mean, this goes deep. It can be generational, right? Like uh, I always talk about the generational impact that we're having <clears throat> on the next generation. And then what most people aren't thinking about is how is this going to impact, you know, my grandkids and then furthermore, right? Because everything that's passed down from generation to generation, um, when you're dealing with, you never know. And that's why I tell coaches, you might have a parent who's at home and he just yells 24 seven. And that's all that kid's getting in his head. Uh, the only light that they might have is for when they come, when I come in and actually have a session with them and dad may be sitting back there and he's like squirming in the seat because he knows he's got some things going on. But what I really try to hammer home in those opportunities is you may be getting negative information from your loved ones. And I kind of yeah. pause in that moment, right? This is where you have to block out the negativity all negativity, get it out of the way. And that's my message in that moment, because it can be coming from the parents, you know, and I know this to be true, because then when you have breakout sessions, and you really start getting to the root of that thorn, my dad's always yelling at me, or, you know, there's abuse going on at home. You just, there's so many things that go on in this world that are impacting these athletes. That's phenomenal. Well, so Rick, uh, this has not been the average zealous podcast episode. I'll grant you that. <laughs> you know, not once did we talk about speed training, peak performance on the level of the physical realm. It's this, I honestly think, is one of the most potent, powerful episodes we've probably ever recorded because we're talking about the spiritual health 
within. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking religion. That's you can have your right. own belief system. I'm talking yeah. the spirit that is connected to our our corporal form. You know, this is something that is not really spoken of readily in the training rooms. And it's something that I think we really need to pick apart. Now there's mental skills development and, and performance coaches and so on. And maybe it's starting to kind of percolate up to the surface a little bit. But I think more fellows like yourself within and without the professional sports realm it is really a, a valuable asset that it could be tapped into more. So we're coming up on the end of the, of the podcast, but I'd love to know in terms of sharing your contact information, your websites, your book that's coming out. You mentioned autobiography coming out next, next year, but any publications that you've had up to this point, here's, here's the moment to, to share with everybody. Oh, well, thank you. And, and again, uh, thanks for having me on here. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to share with your viewers, viewers and listeners. Um, hopefully it's been uh, a lot of value here. Um, so yeah, full name is Rick Smith Jr. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, Instagram, uh, even TikTok. Um, and then uh, my website is www.ricksmithchange.com. Uh, recently, what was it, September, I actually started write, writing my autobiography uh, at the beginning of this year, which through the process birthed something else called behavior change. Um, and so I just kind of took in the context of, okay, like, my, my autobiography is cool, but what can I actually take to give somebody that they could read today and go and implement behavior change? And so um, I created behavior change, uh, subtitled being impacting the next generation. And it's a quick read. It's very quick. It's concise. Uh, you could literally get this done in 30 minutes if you wanted to and start making change in your life. Um, no matter if it's a bad habit, attitude, uh, you know, many different ways to apply this. Uh, so that's on Amazon and Kindle. And then um, in the first quarter of next year, which is uh, currently being worked on is the, the autobiography with all the war stories. So, um, you know, looking for looking forward to that as well. Well, that's got to be pretty cathartic for yourself to just mm. get it all out. Uh, very, very healing in some ways. And, and if you can share your experience and others can relate and they create change themselves. I mean, what, what better gift to give back, right? Absolutely. Oh, Rick, this has been great. I really appreciate your time. And again, your candor, transparency and, and vulnerability. It, it's just, it's something that is, is not taken lightly. And, and, and I'm very grateful for your willingness to do so. So thanks for coming on. Well, thank you, Rocky. I appreciate it again. <clears throat> Yeah, that was pretty heavy, I would say so. And I just love it when truth emerges and people can be sincere, open, honest, and really talk about the deeper levels, really going deep. I hope you enjoyed it, you got something out of it because I am moved by that conversation with Rick. I just can't thank him enough. Until next week, be good, share some truth with somebody. We'll see you then.